let me go back. Uh, the, this meeting is being recorded, so uh, please remember that and if you don't want to, to be recorded, um, just stay silent, use the chat or, or leave the meeting. Uh, so I will start recording as well from my side. So welcome again to the Uyuni Community Hours, uh, April's edition. My name is Raul. I am the release engineer for Uyuni, one of them together with Marina. And today's agenda, uh, first of all, I will speak of Uyuni 2403, the new release, what is new in this one. And then we have four sessions from different presenters. First one will be about native upstream support in Uyuni by Jan. The second one about the docs uh, on the containerized server by Joseph. Then the confidential computing attestation, which is something uh, new that are, we are sharing the community hours for the first time. Uh, it will be uh, mainly Michael uh, speaking about this. And last but not least, Cedric will be speaking about developing against the containerized server. So without further ado, first topic. The new release, Uni 2403, uh, what's new? And uh, first of all, uh, I am pulling this slide from the previous uh, community hours uh, that uh, Marina presented. And, and this is for you not to forget about the containerized Uni, uh, the release strategy that will be uh, that will be carrying going forward. So uh, we just released 2403 even if it was in april uh, we kept the the name um, there is not going to be a 2404 because we are already quite uh, finishing the, the month and uh, it wouldn't be ready so the next release is going to be called dot uh, 05 and uh, this is going to be the first release uh, that is going to remove the text preview from the container and uh, from the containerized uh, version. Uh, we plan to have an, a dot 06 and a dot 07. Uh, this is of course subject to uh, last minute changes, but uh, the version of July is going to be the first one that is not going to be released as RPMs. So this is again a warning for you to plan accordingly uh, to move to the containerized version. And also as a reminder, uh, the .07 um, version will also have a different uh, operating system underneath. And now going uh, to the later release 2403, what's new? So we have the confidential computing attestation. I'm not going to speak a lot about that because Michael is telling us later. Uh, we have the enhanced CVE audit. Uh, you might have already uh, seen a little bit of this in previous editions of the, of the co community hours. This was presented here. Then uh, the, uh, the containerized server uh, was upgraded to Java 17, only the containerized server. So the RPM version still stays in, in Java 11. And um, the monitor for monitoring, the node exported was upgraded to version 1.7.0. And there were a couple of important Ansible CV fixes that are listed below. So do you have any questions about the release strategy or the latest version of, of Uni? Okay, it doesn't look like. So we can go with the first session of today that is going to be the native upstream support. And this is uh, Jan, so I am going to stop sharing. And Jan, if you're ready, sure. I can see your screen. Yes, okay, great. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Jan. I'm a developer um, in the SUSE Manager team, also developing for Uyuni. And yeah, today I'm very excited to share with you um, the uh, native upstream support um, in Uyuni. Um, yeah, probably uh, most of you. Um, already know about AppStreams. This is the uh, modular repository support in Red Hat-like systems, including um, Red Hat, of course. 
um, Rocky Linux, Alma Linux, Oracle Linux, uh, etc. Um, so far, um, we only uh, had limited support in, with, with app streams. Um, you had to create regular repositories, um, doing some operations in content lifecycle management to be able to use them together with um, uni but as of now we have uh, full support for this and today i'm going to showcase you this um but first of all um a, a disclaimer this is not yet um, released in dot o3 uh, version um and it's going to be released with the next version together with also so the manager 5.0 so um let's get to the demo so i have a, a rocky linux 9 system registered here in my instance already and all the um necessary rocky linux 9 channels synchronized also uh, let me go to the systems list and this is my um, rocky linux server um first of all i think okay so the channels are sub subscribed so um first thing to notice here um when you do the, you did this in previous versions you would see a big um, yellow warning on top of the screen that's saying um uh, modular repositories are not supported so please use clm to create regular repositories from those so that warning is gone now you don't have to do this anymore so um i'm uh, going to go um, to, as example, I chose um, Node.js module. So I'm going to show you how to do some um, package installs and upgrades uh, with Node.js module um, using different major versions of it. So um, I'll first go to software packages and install to see um, what packages of Node.js uh, are available to me already. Okay, I'll filter it with Node.js. Okay, when I search for Node.js in the installable packages list, I see here Node.js version 16, which is a regular package. It doesn't belong to any module. So this is um, basically how it works with um, Rocky 9. Um, but now I will go to the AppStream stuff, which is a new tab here. It only appears when you have any uh, modular repositories assigned on a specific system. So I go to this AppStreams, and this is a new page that we designed to handle app streams so here you can see uh, the list of all the modules that belongs to um, every modular channel that this system is assigned so first up we have the app stream channel here and also an additional crb channel here um, so let's say we want to install node.js 18 so first of all i need to to uh, enable um, node.js uh, 18 stream here clicking on this and applying changes. Um, it's a regular um, uni action that you, you've probably seen everywhere. And when I confirm this, um, this creates an event to be scheduled in the system, which is already finished. So this basically under the hood, if you're curious, under the hood, it's, it uses some additional um, salt uh, modules to salt methods to, to execute the operations on the client. And the executed operations are simple DNF commands. So this is an equivalent of um, writing, typing DNF module enable Node.js 18. So this is ready now. And if I go back to AppStreams page, I can see that it's enabled now. So let's try the um, searching for Node.js again. Okay, now I can see a lot more packages because the Node.js 18 module is enabled on the client. And you can already notice these tiny little badges here uh, next to some um, some of the packages. These denote uh, modular packages and what module and what stream they belong to. So these Node.js 18 packages are uh, appeared just now after enable, uh, enabling the um, module. So let's, let's just install Node.js from here. 
I only need to select the main package. The, all the dependencies are going to be installed automatically anyway. Let's wait, wait a little bit until the package is installed. OK. So now I have Node.js 18 module enabled and Node.js 18 installed on the on the system. So let's say, yeah, to 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 show you the um, other pages as well. Let's say um, at some point I want to upgrade from Node.js 18 to 20 in this in this um, system. Um, I would simply um, enable here Node.js 20 instead of 18. Apply it. I will check and make sure the action is complete. Also, let's wait for the package list refresh. OK, so now I have Node.js 20 enab uh, enabled in the system. So first, yeah, let's. Um, this is the list of inst already installed packages on the system. So I can still see Node.js 18 is installed. But when I go to upgrade, um, I can search for Node.js here. And now I can see um, the, the, the update candidates for Node.js. So it's basically an upgrade from 18 to 20. So if I do this, upgrade to Node.js 20. Now in the system, I have Node.js 20. So um, apart from that, we have uh, some new API endpoints that support all these operations on the API side. Um, let me try to find you. So we have one um, new namespace called system.appstreams. This includes all the modules to um, enable, disable, or view the uh, enabled modules on a, on a client. These, this, this is um, all uh, operations on the, on the client side. So I can use this method to disable a module. Um, I can use this one to enable one, specifying the module name and the stream name. And also I can list all the module streams that are available to a client and uh, together with the in information about if it's enabled or not. And apart from this, we have one additional namespace and that is channel.upstreams. And this, instead of a client, this works on the channel side of things. So I can here um, in the list of methods, there's is modular. Um, that you give a channel label and get a get the result true or false if it's modular channel or not. You can also list all the modular channels that you have in your organization, and you can. Hmm. Okay, I think this is by mistake here in the documentation, but yeah, it should be these two. So um, actually, this is all. Um, that I wanted to show you today. I hope you will find this useful. I mean, it was quite a uh, quite troublesome to do this all the way with CLM um, building um, without the module metadata, etc. So it should be uh, a lot easier to use as it is now. And with that, I can start getting some questions if you have any. Okay, there was already some positive feedback in the chat. But other than that, is any question, anything you want to point out? I just want to say thank you, Stefan, here. It's, it's a really nice way how it was realized and how it turned out in the end. It's, I really like it. Thanks. Thanks, Stefan. OK. OK, I Stefan. guess we can move on then. Okay, so next session will be by uh, Joseph about uh, docs on the containerized server. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph Kaywood. I'm the squad leader for Unidocs. Um, I hope you can see the screen. I yes. can. Okay, all right. So here's a brief update on the latest developments. Um, We've currently uh, divided the quick start into two distinct sections now, one for container deployment and one for legacy installation. Uh, container deployment includes uh, deploying a uni server um, from um, Leap Micro. 
And we've also extensively uh, revised the deployment upgrade guide and expect many more updates to come in the following weeks. But we have condensed down the requirements sections. So everything's greatly simplified from how it was before, multiple pages and leading all over the place. Um, things are clearer. The requirements for networking are much clearer now. Installation deployment has been uh, simplified into just two categories, server and proxy. And under both, you've got the legacy install or the deployment install. Um, we are continuing working on setup migration. This will come shortly. Um, so just as a quick note, we have a uh, important warning on the front page here that uh, there are going to be gaps in docs and that we're currently moving through content and updating and uh, deprecating a lot of the uh, traditional stack content. So expect some gaps in information. Yeah, so anyway, with this restructuring, we've, aim we've aimed to clarify uh, the user navigation, um, ensuring that the documentation keeps up to date with uh, the evolving product features. And again, it's important to note that this content's going to change, um, but it's shaping up to be really nice. <laughs> I'm quite proud of the uh, results and where it's going. Um, this is pretty much it. It was a short update. Uh, does anyone have any further questions? Okay, it doesn't look like nothing in the okay. chat. So thanks a lot, Joseph. Uh, and remember that you can contribute to the documentation in the button that uh, Joseph is uh, showing on the top right. There is a button to contribute. Yeah, also on the front page. Uh, oh, well, uh, actually in the way, in the disclaimer as well. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. So let's go back to my slides. Next one is going to be uh, Michael with confidential computing at the station. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Hello, everybody. So, um, yeah, this is now the first time that uh, we talk about confidential computing attestation feature in Uyuni. Um, maybe some words in the beginning. What the hell is that? Uh, so, um, so the idea comes from uh, the fact that when you are in the public cloud or in virtual environments, that there are other virtual environments uh, next to you, which you might not control. You don't have any idea who is who is on that one, especially in the cloud. And if they maybe can break out um, uh, out of their uh, virtual environment and um, sneak into your virtual environment and get data out of that one. Uh, so, or uh, the other way it's around uh, what happens uh, if uh, you are not owner of the data center and there is an admin in that data center who is has now physical access to the host and try to get the data you are um, operating uh, with uh, in your virtual machine. And uh, to um, yeah, get around this problem, um, they invented these confidential computing. Uh, and one of the key points here is uh, to uh, encrypt the memory uh, uh, for the virtual machine so that uh, only the CPU and the, uh, and the, and the virtual machine software <coughs> has real access to, to, to the real data. This is called um, SEV-SNP, at least this is the, the latest uh, version uh, of this. And uh, this is, uh, as this technology is uh, created by uh, AMD. Uh, Intel had, has something similar, but that is not yet ready for uh this attestation feature so attestation so this is um the thing what uh uyuni is now uh supporting uh so we are not supporting yet to set up such a thing uh it's only about that we can uh find out so if your v uh, virtual machine uh, is running in this confidential mode um, and uh, yeah, let me quickly show you how, how this works in practice. So here we have the Uni server. So this is our um, 
yeah, RFC about that one. Uh, so, and in principle, we are going here to the minion with a state apply and requesting here a report. Um, and uh, we are getting this report back, storing that stuff in the database. And then we have an attestation container, which is a small um, container, which contains already some of the certificates uh, and uh, which is then requesting uh, the, the final um, uh, certificate called VCAC um, from, uh, from AMD directly, and then performing the complete uh, validation uh, of all the certificates and storing the result back in the database. So all this is supported by a tool which is called SMP Guest. Uh, and SMP Guest has here a regular attestation uh, flow chart, uh, which is um, nice uh, and, and shows this uh, again a little bit uh, in, in a, a better way. So here you have the guest system. And on the guest system, you are calling the SMP guest tool report. And this is going down through the virtualization software down to the AMD processor. And that AMD processor is creating a report and signing it with a key which is uh, encoded in hardware. So it, this key exists in hardware inside of the processor. Uh, and, and that report is uh, um, uh, reported back. We are now getting this report back and we are storing it in the database. And now our attestation container comes into uh, this game. Uh, and uh, we are not calling this SMP guest fetch CA because we have the CA certificate as part of the container. Uh, so, and, um, but we are fetching this, this VCAC uh, from the AMD key distribution service. And then, uh, the SMB guest tool is verifying the certificates that all the certificates are correct. And the, then we are verifying the attestation so that the report is correctly signed with the VCAC. And with this, uh, we know that, that the chain is complete and correct. And we know also uh, because uh, that key was from AMD, it's, it's not from any kind of OS vendor, it's not from a um, from a public cloud vendor or something like that. It's really from the hardware vendor, so uh, the, the vendor of the CPU. And, uh, and, and with this, uh, so you can, you can trust that, uh, that not your uh, data center uh, provider is, is maybe, uh, is able to cheat you. Okay, so now let's have a look how this practically works. Um, but yeah, first let's have a look how to set this up. Uh, so this is a feature which is only working on the um, containerized version because we need uh, the attestation as a container. So and uh, so already shown uh, in, in last sessions. So we have here um, the uh, install Podman uh, command, and this got now new um, flags here uh, for uh, the confidential computing uh, um, image. So you can uh, provide here the image string, the, the number of replicas currently only uh, zero or one, uh, and a tag which is then uh, typically latest here. And uh, with that, you set up uh, a system uh, and and together also the the com uh, confidential compute attestation. So uh, let's try this out. So here we have, it's currently still everything on master. Uh, we still have here the, the standard image uh, for, the, for the main server. And here we now have the Coco image, um, which is server attestation. And we want one re replica of that one. So, and now, uh, yeah, we uh, ask for some passwords. and the email address. So, and now the setup is starting. So, and uh, yeah, we don't want to wait so long. So I have prepared something uh, where we can already go directly into the UI. So, and uh, yeah, this is another setup I made already. And uh, here uh, I have already uh, registered a client 
Uh, that client is a special one which supports confidential computing. So it's running on a host, which is set up for that one with correctly BIOS uh, uh, um, set up, made correctly, and a new lib, uh, KVM, uh, which supports all of that one. So uh, there are a lot of requirements uh, on the OS, host OS, and on the, on the virtualization software, uh, which needs to be met. Um, so, and uh, I hope that somebody will, will document that, how to set this up in the future from our OS vendors. So, um, yeah, and when you now go here to audit, you see here a new um, tab about confidential computing. Uh, and that is only visible if, if the OS in principle supports it. So, and that requires, um, yeah, um, I think, uh, so a leap 16, a 15.6 or um, also a less uh, 15 uh, SP6. Uh, and um, you come here directly to the settings page. And the first thing what you need to do is to say, yes, I want to enable attestation for this system. Uh, and the next thing, and this is important, you need to uh, tell about what is the environment type. And as you see, currently we are only supporting two of them. This is a KVM setup on AMD EPIC processors. The EPIC processors are the only ones who have this technology. Uh, and we, they have two generations. So the third, uh, at the second and the third generation, Milan and Genoa, these are the only ones who support that. The problem is we cannot auto detect that. Uh, so you need to know where uh, where uh, your uh, VM is running on, and um, our test one is is running on a Milan processor. Uh, and what uh, we can also uh, say directly here is we want to perform an attestation during the boot process or on reboot. Um, thing is very easy because when you have a valid attestation then you know that as long as the system is running then it's uh, then uh, the, um, it's confidential but with a reboot or when you shut down and start again somebody could have tweaked the bio settings somebody could have tweaked the the um the virtual uh, the um uh, the virtualization software and so on. So you cannot be sure that that uh, your machine is still confident. So, and that makes sense to perform uh, the attestation on, on boot. Okay, so now we have stored uh, this one. And the second tab we have here is about listing. Uh, and yeah, as you can see, currently there's nothing here, uh, but we can do uh, and schedule an attestation here. So, uh, this is now um, have started uh, an attestation. So as you can see, we had some runs before in a, in a different one, uh, but uh, this one should now be here. Not cool. Now it's not working. <coughs> Let me see what it is. Minion is down or cannot be contacted. Uh -huh. so, yeah, sometimes this one is crashing. Um, And let me see. So we need to boot up uh, the machine. The problem is easy. The host is is uh, is a development machine from from our um, architecture department. So and and they from time to time reboot the machine or uh, doing doing these kind of things. So uh, it could happen that this is then sometimes uh, not working. So okay. So now the machine is booting up. Uh, And that could now happen uh, so that we get automatically a new regist uh, attestation. Let me see. Yeah, because we set on boot. So now we booted. So that means automatically um, an attestation is scheduled from the system by the system. Uh, it's it's not directly started. So we are, we are waiting at least one minute up to uh, 90 uh, seconds. Um, just to be sure that the machine is fully up uh, during boot. And uh, so now uh, the, the attestation should happen uh, at, at that time. Uh, and then we can see, but we can also see here the failed attestation. Oops. Yeah, 
So the failed attestation is, is already also here visible. This was the one uh, where the minion was down. And as you can see, this one is now currently pending. In the meanwhile, we can have a look So this is here our setup um, of the uh, image, and uh, that was successful. Um, let me see, Potman PS. And now, as you can see, we have not only here the, the server image, we have also the attestation image running here. Um, so this is how, how the setup is working. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look what happened here. So here you can now see the next confidential was successful, successfully collected attestation data. But when we now look here into the list attestation, you see again failed. But let's have a look what it is. So now you see we have two attestations here. AMD, SEV, SNP. So this is uh, the, the encryption of, uh, so these um, encrypted virtual nested paging um, service. And uh, what we write down here is a report. This is a report we get from the CPU um, with here some uh, microcode information and uh, also some uh, uh, nonce data we added here. And here in the process output, you see all the steps we did and, and the output of the commands. So here you can see that uh, the, uh, we uh, checked about the ARC and, and the ASK and the VCAC. Uh, and here that uh, reported uh, the TCB bootloader from the certificate matches the attestation report uh, and the uh, en encrypted environment, SNP micro uh, certificate chip ID is everything is okay. And the VCAC signed by the attestation report. So that part is okay, but we have added a second one, which is secure boot. Uh, we ch check if, if, the, um, uh, if the VM is doing secure boot and that failed, that check failed uh, because secure boot is disabled. Honestly, we have to say that you cannot enable it currently because it does not work together with this technology. So this is something um, our developers from the SLE department are still working on uh, to make this possible um, to have secure boot together with uh, this um, uh, uh, attestation. Uh, and another check which may come in future is of course also uh, checking maybe if the disk are encrypted. So, and um, of course we expect also in future to have um, uh, Intel CPU support. Um, maybe with the same tool, maybe there is a different tool about that one because the Intel TDX uh, works a little bit different than the AMD. Uh, so let's see. And then, of course, all this, um, all the cloud providers are doing also their own stuff. So maybe we need also an special um, environments for the cloud or for every cloud provider, maybe something different. So and these are the possible enhancements which might come in the next years. Um, so finally, we have here also uh, under audit, we have here also confidential computing, which is listing the attestations. And if we would have multiple systems, uh, we would see here all the systems. So all attestations from these systems. Another thing what we have, of course, APIs. Um, you find them here via system. So let Let's see everything what is, uh, has Coco. Uh, get Coco attestation config. So here we are getting the configuration. We have here result details, uh, get latest attestation report. Uh, we have here listing, listing of reports uh, in, in some various cases, especially when it comes to filtering. So um, reports um, newer than a special date or reports um, just a limited uh, with batching and uh, these uh, things is here supported. And of course, the schedule Cocoa attestation. And another thing, but for that one, I need 
first two go to here the tasks. Um, 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 um. No. We need to update the reporting bunch. Uh, so because we have added these um, uh, attestations also to our report database. So uh, here I'm now on the host system and uh, with mgrctl term, you get a terminal inside of the container and with spacewalk report here, you get here the uh, available reports and here we added two new reports about Coco attestation. So, and um, yeah, as you can see here, we have here uh, the report ID, uh, the system ID, uh, we have here organization, we have here the environment type, that is the Epic Milan, then that the stuff failed, uh, report status and uh, this, uh, and the number of um, uh, passed and failed um, uh, attestations. And as you can see here, we have here one and one. So that means one failed, one passed. And with the results, we are getting here the one from attestation from report ID four. Uh, we have here the SNP, which was succeeded. Um, and here we see the secure boot, which failed. So of course, we just have these uh, uh, two attestations and where only one um, reported some results. So you would see here, of course, all the results from all the systems. Okay, and with this, I am at the end of my uh, showing here. Uh, now the question to uh, Kevin and Thomas, do you have something to add? Not from my side, no. The only small thing is that, yes, we have also pages in the system set, uh, so you can mass configure and mass schedule uh, the attestation on multiple, on multiple systems. That's the only thing. Exactly. There's something I forgot. So where was it? We have it here audit now. Yeah. And uh, we have here configuration of, of confidential compute. Here you can set the configuration for multiple systems. And we can schedule here also for multiple system in one shot. Okay. So then, questions? Okay, so far I see the chat silent. Is there anything you would like to ask or comment about this? Okay, it doesn't look like, so thanks a lot, Michael. And we can go on to the next presentation that will be Cedric's uh, for developing against the containerized server. So Cedric, if you're ready. Yeah, you are on mute. Ready. Okay. Uh, start screen sharing, which is it? Ah, it doesn't, oh no, it, it shows me which screen it is, hopefully. Allow. So you should see my slide, right? Yes. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So here, um, talking about developing against a containerized server, there are some, some differences. And uh, here, the idea is to make everyone's life easy and um, give you tips and tricks there. Uh, first, SumaForm. SumaForm is a tool that we um, developers use quite a lot to deploy test environments um, of the uni with some clients and so on. And there have been a new module in there. So SumaForm is based on, on Terraform with salt states as well. 
And in the past, we had a server module that was deploying the server. And now we have a server containerized module that is deploying the server inside a container on a VM. Um, the container repository uh, variable will let you configure where you want to pull the server containers. And uh, you just don't add the uh, slash slash server at the end of the URL because um, this is just one image and the repository, uh, could, it's just a folder in the registry where you could have multiple images. For now, we have just one big image, but at some point later, we probably will have more. Uh, you also have a runtime variable in this module that you can define to K3S. And in this case, instead of deploying the container on Padman, it will deploy it on K3S. We have uh, base images, uh, images for Leap Micro for this uh, server containerized uh, module deployment, but we've seen that it's quite fragile for now. Um, sometimes Terraform thinks that the um, the VM is is just um, timing out, and in fact, it's ju it just takes a bit more, a bit too much time to install everything in in the combustion phase, uh, initial phase. And Terraform cannot get the um, IP address using the guest agent, so it happens from time to time. It's quite, it's still fragile, but um, it's just a small form problem. Uh, of course, if you want to compare between server containerized and server modules, there are some variables in the server containerized modules that are not implemented yet. Uh, server containerized is basically a copy paste of the server module and um, adapted what it was needed for the um, initial setup day-to-day -day operation with the container so this is for developers but not only right uh, mgr adm will give uh, is a tool that you have on, on the, the host where you run the server it needs to run as root, and uh, it allows you to install the container, up, obviously, upgrade, migrate from uh, um, an existing uni, non-containerized uni, but that is a different topic. And uh, it also has, has commands to start, stop, restart, and, and get the status of uh, the server. If you need to get inside the container, uh, Michel already sh has shown it in action earlier. There is the mgrctl term command, which is basically an alias for mgrctl exec minus t minus i bash. So you just get a bash inside your, your container. Uh, you can also run commands using mgrctl exec. Here you see the double dashes to, to separate the command parameters from the exact parameters. And you also have a CP command to copy files from and to the container. The server column prefix will give you, will tell that the path is inside the container. And MGRCTL tool can be installed on the server host, as of course, but anywhere else. We'll see it now. Remote connections. So, and this is the um, the, the, the sugar and the cake for developers. So you install MGRCTL on your development machine. For Podman, you need to set up a remote connection, Podman system connection, add. Uh, in my case, I added an ident identity, SSH identity, so the key, the private key. You give it a name to the connection. Here, I, I named it dev, and then the URL to the, to the server. Once you have this defined, the only thing you need to 
to tell Podman to connect to, to this remote connection is to export container underscore connection variable with the dev value. And this works for plain old Podman commands, but it also works with MGRCTL because MGRCTL just calls Podman in the end. So MGRCTL exec minus T minus uh, SH from your development machine will with this environment variable will get you a, a terminal inside your container. If you go with Kubernetes, um, the setup is a bit different. It is just relying on kubeconfig to be correctly set up. Um, here, you, you, you change your configuration, you define the context to use, and there is nothing to export, just MGRCTL will just use the default Kubernetes connection. This is fine, but you also have ant targets. Um, the ant targets were already, we already had ant targets to deploy to, um, to the server, but they are new targets to deploy to a container server. Uh, if you're running Podman, you, you still need the um, environment variable. And then you, you, you call add minus F with the manager built XML file. Just, this doesn't change. What changes is that the, um, you add a dash container at, at the end of some targets like deploy restart, and it will run a deploy and a restart on the container and not on a uh, regular server. Uh, I gave you some names here uh, of uh, targets that could be used here. Obviously, if something is broken in one of these targets, feel free to report or even fix it. There has been just one change for Java debugging, only one. Um, in the past, we had to, we were using port 8000 to connect to Tomcat to run remote debugging sessions. But in the um, K3S world, traffic is already using this port. So we cannot use 8000. So I changed to uh, Tomcat to 8003. So in every, every server now, even um, RPM installed, the uh, debugging port for Tomcat is 8003. Everything else doesn't change. There is still one thing that changes and that can bite you, persistence. So imagine you are developing some, some changes and um, a Java change, for instance. You deploy your, using your end target, you start debugging, fine. Next day, you want to test it again or continue the tests. And uh, you restart your container and you try, it doesn't work. Why? Because when you start the container, it uses the image, the, the blank image, not the thing that the image with your changes. That's the, the goodness of containers. The, when you restart, it starts from scratch just loads the data from the volumes and that's it. So if you really want to have some changes like uh, changes in jar files and source states and Python files, or whatever, either you, you need to remember to deploy them at every start or you need to build an image, um, a server image with your changes. Uh, and we'll see that later. Um, you also need to be aware that um, we have a limited list of volumes. It's, well, it's quite big already, but um, the data that we persist are in volumes. I gave you the link here to the code where we have the list of all volumes. And uh, that means that everything that is not in these volumes is not persisted. And if you have you add changes in an RPM that goes into one of these volumes, 
you're fine for first installations. For upgrade, it would be hidden by the volume itself. And this is why um, we now have a uni update config script that is refreshing these um, this 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 uh, these changes. So, branching the server image. This is useful. Oh, um, it's not ISC here. It's OSC. Uh, I changed these slides because I gave it to internal colleagues uh, internally for colleagues. Changed many things, but not the OSC. So OSC BCO. So and, and you have the um, the URL to the server image that we built for for master. That will create a branch in your OPS project. And you can export these values, export test, export OPS project. Uh, I think I need another export for OSC API. I'll add this to the slides uh, so that we can get them later. And then these scripts are coming from uh, build package for OBS and push package for OBS are coming from the Uyuni Red Edge tools. So you can push your, your the changes that you have committed in your local Git to your OBS branch. It rebuilds, and you can use this branch uh, name in your container deployment. So this way, what you have in your container image will be what you have at the next restart it will be persisted um, test suite for those who are hacking the test suite there are a few changes not much in fact but very important changes so you have on, on node node is representing um a virtual machine, so server or client or proxy, whatever. And now it has two functions to run commands run and run local. Run local executes on the on the VM itself. And run will detect if MGRCTL is installed. If MGRCTL is installed, it will wrap the the, um, the command inside mgrctl exec otherwise it if mgrctl is not installed run is just like run local and well that's about it uh probably you have questions let me see if you guys see questions in the chat There was Joseph was sharing the link to uh, GitHub the, uh, regarding the persistent container volumes. Okay, so this one. Yes. Uh, yeah, and please uh, provide feedback if there's anything incorrect there. <laughs> but yeah, it, it should be uh, up to date. It looks like um, there is no question. Actually, Marina wanted me to share this link as well. Uh, this is the list of commands explaining how to build the sources from uh, Git ah. and push to OBS. OK, here it is. So this is valid for RPMs. It's also valid for container images. So if if we go in in a tree master containers, um, 
so this is containers folder in the in the, the, the tree uh, here are all the images that we are building server images here and you can change things into the docker file and and upload your changes and even if you are adding changes to an rpm that is in, used by the, the image still you need to branch the server image to get yours uh, your image built in the end even though you are not changing in anything in, in the docker file Okay, so if there are no further questions or comments, uh, I think we can finish with this presentation. Thanks a lot, Cedric. And uh, we finished with all the presentations for today. Uh, is there any general questions or anything that came up to your mind from the previous presentations that you would like to ask about? Okay, so this isn't does... from the presentations or anything. I was just wondering how soon Uyuni would have Ubuntu 2404 available. Good, good question. Uh, so uh, we are planning to have it for uh, 2406 or 2407. Um, Okay, great. Just, just wanted to clarify that. Okay, any other question? Okay, so just on the top of the hour, thanks a lot everyone for attending. I am going to uh, stop the recording first of all. Uh, and thanks for attending and see you in the next uh, session in around a month. Bye. Bye now.